that one first, or let's just focus on that one, and everybody else will be the same. So this is what a neuron and skeletal muscle's action potential looks like. We are now going to look at what a SA node's action potential looks like. You have a nice slide in your lecture notes that does the same thing. So we're just kind of teaching you a little bit about the lecture right now. So we're going to come up and bring it sort of like this. We're going to kind of come down like this. And then we're going to kind of come back up like this. And let me bring this down to here a little bit more. And what I want you to realize is, so this is one action potential right here. Mm -hmm. See how there's no undershoot that we have over here? We start here we, and we end here. Now we put in our threshold of line. What we want to understand is what is responsible for the depolarization and the repolarization of our action potential here. So this is why I have some colors. We're going to draw this orange part right here. And that is due to sodium coming into the cell. Just like we did in the sense right over here in a neuron, right? Going from resting to threshold, we had sodium ions coming in. Well, here we have sodium ions coming into the cell as well, making the cell more positive. Now, the cell we're talking about is an SA node. So sodium comes into an SA node that makes the membrane potential become less negative, become more positive until it reaches threshold. Now this is what's different. Remember in a neuron or skeletal muscle, when we took the membrane and brought it toward threshold, usually because of sodium ions, we opened up voltage-gated sodium channels, right? And sodium comes rushing into the cell, making for a rapid depolarization. Well, now we're not using sodium after the dotted line. We have some new ions, calcium ions. That's why I'm changing the color to represent a change in ion that's responsible for that behavior of our membrane potential. So this then is due to calcium in the cell. Now, what's nice is the repolarization of a neuron or skeletal muscle was due to what ion? Potassium. Which way is potassium diffusing? Out. In or out? Out. Moving out. Same thing over here. At least that's one thing that you can remember that's the same as a neuron. This is simply due to potassium diffusing out of the cell. There is potassium diffusing out. And we come back to about here. And then we simply automatically start all over again like we did the last time. So instead of having just two ions play a role in our action potential, right? Sodium for the depolarization, potassium for the repolarization, here you have three ions. Sodium up to threshold, calcium from threshold to the top of the action potential, and then potassium back to the repolarization part. So we have three different voltage-gated channels to think about in an SA node's membrane or the AV node, or the Purkinje fibers. So they're all the same type of a cell. They all have these gated channels. So remember, they're all dealing with, I guess I'll keep it from the blues and green. So this would be a voltage-gated cell. Blue would be right, potassium going out. And it would be a voltage-gated channel. And this would be then due to a voltage-gated calcium channel. What did we call this part of our membrane potential? Resting. Right, resting, right? It means it'll stay at negative seven until you apply a stimulus. There is no resting membrane here. It never rests. It's the constant fluctuation. It's simply just a, a combination of depolarization and repolarization, then another depolarization and another repolarization. In a sense, as the cell becomes more negative, that triggers the next one. Now, what we want to look at is how ions can influence this action potential. So we're going to come over here, and we're going to draw a cell 
big enough for us to look at. We know there's way more potassium inside of a cell, right, than there is outside of the cell. So let's pretend we have a thousand potassium ions inside. And let's say we have normally a hundred potassium ions outside. Let's say that's normal. Now, does anybody know of a way to cause the extracellular environment to become higher than normal in potassium values? You actually have too much potassium in your blood. How can you get too much potassium in your blood? Any ideas? <laughs> yeah. Supplement. So how many bananas do you have to eat, you think, to get to a lot. Probably a crap load, right? Yeah. You'd get nauseous of bananas if you were but that's the right idea, right? A dietary source. Right? Or what if you for some reason bought just potassium supplements and were eating them like candy, right? <laughs> or how about this? So a couple of years ago my dad had a pacemaker installed. A really cool one. It was a self-adapting. It would change his heart rate based upon exercise levels. And my, my dad is a retired PhD from Stanford Thermal University, Thermal. right? Thermal sciences, heat and mass transfer, world renowned in his field, 87 years old today, and he gets calls from NASA to help him fix problems. I hate his guts. Right? Yeah. He's brilliant. Right? I don't hate his guts. Um, but one day we were sitting in our, in our condominium in Sun Valley after a, a day of fishing a couple of years back and we're drinking some bourbon and just chit-chatting about stuff. Now remember, my dad is a brilliant man, he's really, 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 really smart. And he's talking about now having some chest problems. I go, okay, wait a minute, you just had a pacemaker, we need to go down to the hospital because this is, this is not a good deal here, what's going on? And he's talking about this, this fluttering he's getting and his pacemaker shouldn't be allowing that to happen, it should be a self-adjusting pacemaker. And we're sitting there and we're drinking and we're nibbling on you know, shrimp and brie cheese and he's nibbling on something like, what are you eating? I said, oh, these, oh, these are awesome. These are sun-dried tomatoes. And I'm like, and this is the first time I had a legitimate thing to say saying, you stupid son of a bitch. What's wrong with you? What? He said, what do you mean? He said, wait, 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 you're the PhD. I mean, he knows about this crap. He's a smart man. He said, what are you doing? He said, what's a sun-dried tomato? Well, it's a tomato that's been, you know, dried out through a decantation process in the sun or some heat or whatever. All right, so really, you're taking what, like a beefsteak tomato? He said, yeah. And, and you're shrinking it down to what size? Like the size of a raisin. So how many beefsteak tomatoes can you eat? Well, three or four before I get stuffed. How many raisins can you eat before you get stuffed? Wow couple of cups worth, like a whole carton, a whole case of beefsteak tomatoes. So when you dry something out, like take a banana, make banana chips out of it, right? It's a lot smaller and you concentrate the things that are in it. So if you're eating one or two little sun-dried tomatoes, that's fine. That's one or two beefsteak tomatoes. But when you're eating 30 or 40 or 50 of them in a day after many, many days, and they're great sources of potassium, he was consuming high, way higher than normal levels of potassium. No wonder his heart was having problems. Because this is what happens when you eat too much potassium. You get a condition called hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia, I don't have enough room. I'm gonna have to write it partially inside my cell here. Hyper means above, kalemia refers to calcium ions, and let's give us a, a possible scenario. So let's say instead of 100, let's say we have 400 potassium ions instead, just to give us a fictitious number. So normally we have 100, let's say. Now by eating lots and lots of sunlight tomatoes, we have risen our extracellular potassium levels to now 400. What will that do to the diffusion rate of potassium? It'll slow it down, right? So it's just like the physio X exercise with neurophysiology. But remember, when you decrease the gradient, you decrease the rate of diffusion. All right, well, who cares? What does that do then to this idea? Right? This is due to a certain rate of potassium leaving the cell, right? To cause the cell to repolarize. But what if you slow down how fast potassium can leave the cell? What would that do to this action potential? 
It's going to stretch it out. It's going to take longer to be polarized. It'll slow down your heart rate, in a sense. So it might look something like this if you were to try and plot it. You know, where you're going to get now a longer repolarization phase. You'll end up coming back to the normal amount, but it's going to take longer. So hyperkalemia will then lead to a condition called bradycardia. which means a slower than normal heart rate, slower than normal resting heart rate. But now there's a specific definition for bradycardia. Bradycardia is going to be a heart rate that's going to be less than or equal to 60 beats per minute. It's a resting heart rate, so we'll go RHR. Resting heart rate of less than 60 beats a minute for the normal person. Now let, let's qualify that. I go to the doctor and he says, John, your blood pressure is 72, oh, it's your blood pressure. Your heart rate is 72 beats a minute. And my medical history always says, when I ever get it taken, it's always 72 beats a minute. Now I go and he takes it and it's, it's down at say 58. Okay, well John's normal is 72. He's now less than or equal to 60 beats a minute. He's now experiencing bradycardia a lower than normal resting heart rate. So in a way you have to kind of know the person in terms of what's normal. Do you guys know who Lance Armstrong is? Mm -hmm. You know what his resting heart rate is? He's a cheater. He's, He's not a, a cheater, cheater in some contexts. It's around 45 is his resting heart rate. Well, according to this definition that he should be suffering from bradycardia. No, he has an abnormally low heart rate due to high cardiovascular fitness. But for the average person, if the average heart rate is 72 beats a minute, then you take it, if you're down to around 60, then we can classify you as having bradycardia. Now, for some reason, your heartbeat is slower than it normally is for you. Why? Well, these ions could be responsible, right? An imbalance of potassium. Could mean that it takes longer for the SA node cell to have the potassium diffuse out which means that it's going to take more time to go through repolarization. It's going to, have to give you a slower than normal heart rate. Now, what I'm trying to point out to you all further along is once you learn one new cool trick, like too much of something, then you can log and figure out not enough of something. If something is a left, there's going to be a right. If there's an up, there's going to be a down. If there's a plus, there's going to be a minus. So there has to be then a scenario where instead of having too much potassium, you would have lower than the normal amounts of potassium. So let's put that in here. Hypokalemia. Let's put it over here. And let's say instead of normally being 100, so I guess we should mark that so you guys don't forget what it means. This would be like normal in black. And that's hyperkalemia in red. Then hypokalemia, we'll put over here. And if 100 is normal, let's make it 10. I mean, yes, these are fictitious amounts. But it's the concept that's important. Well, what would that do then to the potassium diffusion rate? Speed it up. Speed it up because you've now increased the gradient, right? To have them faster. What would that do to this looking profile? And repolarize quicker. So it'll be a, a much more steeper repolarization, right? We'll do it in blue circles. So I, I mistakenly used green for this. I wouldn't want to screw you up with that. So now it might look more like this. What would that do to your heart rate then? It's going to increase your heart rate. And we'll come down back here to zero. So then this would be, we can do this, this would be a faster heart rate. And then this red one would be a slower heart rate. Any ideas how you would experience significantly lower than the normal amounts of potassium in your blood, which then would cause it to be 
around the interstitial fluid of your cardiac cells. How can you lose electrolytes? Exercise. Dehydration is one way to do it, right? Because remember, any ion with a charge, anything that conducts electricity is an electrolyte. So if I put a glass of water, and put sugar in it, and then put a, um, an athode and cathode inside, it won't turn the light on because glucose does not conduct electricity. But if I put salt water in there, it'll shine nice and bright. So dehydration, prolonged dehydration, all right? And this is why we have sports drinks, right? If you exercise for long periods of time, you want to replenish the water and some of the electrolytes. If you look at the ingredients, you're looking at about 4 or 5% sodium and about 2% potassium to replenish what you're losing through perspiration. Because ions play a role in nerve conduction, right? Or in cardiac function. So it's another way of losing lots of potassium. Any moms in the room ever gone to a certain part of the grocery store to buy a certain kind of a liquid replenishment for your little ones? Like a Pedialyte? Pedialyte. Why did you buy them Pedialyte? Uh, to keep them hydrated if so they have like diarrhea or severe diarrhea. vomiting. Severe diarrhea and vomiting can cause drops in electrolytes, which would then, of course, then lead to this, where you get hypokalemia, which is then an increase in heart rate. The term for that is tachycardia. And like bradycardia had a definition, this would be a resting heart rate greater than or equal to 100 beats per minute. Again, it's your resting heart rate, not your exercising heart rate. And again, it has to be above 100. And you can't have a normal resting heart rate of 100 and be considered to be tachycardia. That would be a larger number for you. So excess diarrhea and vomiting can lead to hypokalemia. Mistakeable. You know, dietary intake, you're not really thinking about it, eating lots of bananas or any good green leafy vegetable or not watching your supplements that you're taking because you're taking too many of them can do that. So based upon previous exam histories, I know that students are going to get this mixed up. Bradycardia does not cause hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia causes bradycardia, all right? And tachycardia does not cause hypokalemia. Tachycardia is the symptom. Bradycardia is the symptom. The problem, the cause, is hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. That'll save you at least maybe two points on the next test on the top of the page. Now. There is one other one that doesn't really, well, it, it does play a role with the, the first part over here. And that purple, what's purple? Is this idea. We know that there is way more calcium on the outside than there is calcium on the inside. And of course we have Voltage gated channels now. These would be voltage gated. And these are, of course, voltage gated channels for these guys. Voltage gated. And voltage gated so this might be consistent. Let's put some voltage gated over here as well, just to remind ourselves. What if I have way too much calcium on the outside? There's a term that's an awful lot like hyperkalemia, and I apologize for that, but I didn't create the term. And it's called hypercalcemia, which means higher than normal levels of calcium in the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid, if you like, or in the blood. And they all come from the same thing. Now, if you increase this, if you increase the amount of calcium on the outside, what would that do now to your actual potential in an essay mode, do you think? So you got more than normal. So is this due to calcium leaving the cell or coming into the cell? Coming in, right? Yeah. So 
now you're going to have way more than the normal amount coming in. So what allows the cells to become negative? It's potassium leaving, right? Under normal amounts. If you increase the amount of calcium, then this might actually end up looking like this. It's going up to some value way higher than normal. It may be impossible to repolarize normally. It's sort of like if you were to give someone tetrodotoxin. I'm sorry, let's do metrodotoxin. Where you keep the voltage gated sodium channels open, the won't allow the neuron to actually depolarize. In this case, you let tons of calcium come into the cell, making it very, very positive on the inside. May have a hard time repolarizing. But what else, what else do you know about calcium in skeletal muscles? What role does it play in skeletal muscles? Muscle contraction. Uh, muscle contractions, uh, right? Exercises. The component. Well, we can also have that happen here. Because we are going to see on Wednesday that a part of the calcium for cardiac muscle contraction comes from outside of the cell, not just from the sarcoplasmic tissue of inside. There's a calcium source outside that comes into the cell. If that calcium source that comes from the outside, it can affect SA nodes, but it can also then affect the contractile cells. So when you have hyperkalemia, you screw up two different cell groups. One, the ones that create your pacemakers, that makes the cell become very positive. But it also affects the contractile cells and makes them have a really firm, hard, prolonged contraction. So you're gonna get increase in the force of the contraction. How would you get increased levels of calcium? Again, calcium supplements, right? Foods that are high in calcium can throw up your heart rate. But then there is also one other way you can kind of Take advantage of this. So, any of you ever live on a farm or have animals like cows, sheep, or horses? Really? Wow. Okay. Do you guys never had to have one of your animals put down? I do. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever have a horse put down? Mm. No. Or a sheep? Or no? Your your poor. You you have? I have seen. But you've never had to experience having a vet come and put your horse down or your your cow or your sheep or your pig or your dog, right? Not my dog. So how do they put dogs down? You euthanize them. How do you euthanize them? You put a mask over their face. See, she's looking, she's thinking. Yeah, it's, it's what has this got to do with this conversation here kind of an idea? So. They can kind of go to the socket. Yeah, or what else might work? Put in the socket. Well, you could do that. So let's try this. If I'm, in, if I'm in Texas and I commit murder and I'm sentenced to the death penalty, how will Texas execute you? Lethal injection. Lethal, lethal injection. So what is a lethal injection? What's in it? Doesn't it paralyze you first and then stop your heart rate? Well, they don't paralyze. You have the right idea. The first dose should be a large dose of Valium yeah. to knock you out, to be humane, to be ethical. But what's in the second two syringes? High doses of potassium. So think about this idea. Here we're playing around with, let's say, just 400. But what if we'll do it in, in I guess, black? Instead of giving you this much extra potassium, they gave you something like this much extra potassium. Which way would potassium diffuse, first of all? Into the cell. Into the cell, right? What will that do then to your cardiac rhythmic function here. It's going to screw it up, it right? Down. You're going to continually depolarize. Mm -hmm. And that's why they then also again give you a high dose of calcium. So they may be kind of like this. They're just basically trying to make this do nothing but repolarization. The heart shuts down. Hopefully the volume is working before you do this. There was a case a couple of years ago where it didn't apparently. And the guy went through several heart attacks on, on the table. Which, yeah, I was going to go, oh, wait, that's not supposed to happen. That's considered inhumane. Mm -hmm. So why isn't it the slope for calcium, if you increase the calcium outside of the cell, why isn't the slope steeper, kind of similar how if you have more potassium or less potassium outside the cell? Yeah, well, because remember, we still had a gradient for potassium to leave the cell in the normal scenario, right? We have a gradient here for potassium still to leave, even though we have 
higher amounts. This is gonna cause a slowing down of the heart rate, right? Because it takes longer now to repolarize. If you really screw it up and put an awful lot of a positive charge ion outside, the gradient now is to go into the cell. And that's acting just like calcium would under normal conditions to cause a repolarization. So you simply just make this go up and there's no chance for it to repolarize whatsoever because you totally flip the gradients. I guess more, my question was is if you have an increasing concentration of calcium outside the cell, would the diffusion rate increase and therefore you'd have steeper slope? Yeah, for, for this, yes. But this is almost pretty straight up to begin with. Okay. It's just now going to get to a higher positive value. Yeah, so right, this will become more steep, but it's already almost straight up to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it can't get any straighter than straight. Yes, you have the right idea though. So why would it necessarily be good both like the calcium and the potassium? Because there's no massive connection like the heart rate Yeah, they're just covering their glutus maximuses. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to make sure that you're good and dead. Mm -hmm. um, because it has not worked in, in earlier cases. It's like one of the go ahead. Yeah, they do. Yeah, it just makes it for a very severe repolarization, a positive charge across the membrane. There's no opportunity for repolarization, which means the muscles can't do, go through a contraction cycle because it's going to be these cells that stimulate the contraction. Which is covering your bases with. Yeah. 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 This is why when they first tried to do electrocutions, it was more like an, a barbecue session than a killing session. They just had it totally wrong. Um, and that was because of an argument between Edison and Westinghouse between AC and DC current. And um, Edison, to prove that Westinghouse's idea of alternating current was wrong, he electrocuted an elephant at a circus. And it took hours to kill the poor thing. He was trying to prove how dangerous the current was. Um, we were stupid back then, but we're still Still stupid. Trial and error. Right. <laughs> so then, um, if you increase those concentrations and the slope just continues to go up, is that mm -hmm. your heart is just stuck in right the in contraction the phase? Yeah. Yep. And therefore, it won't work. So you guys will come across these words, these ideas of hyperkalemia and hypokalemia if you go into nursing or PA, probably not PT programs, and. You'll probably be introduced to it in this concept of a straightforward kind of a cookie cutter approach. But put in the back of your mind this little thought, and your exam question will be very straightforward. Your exam question will be about what we have just talked about. But what I want you to realize is when you actually get into this in a cardiac physiology world, what really depends upon how the heart responds is two things. How long you have had abnormal potassium levels and just exactly what that abnormal level is. It causes some kind of an arrhythmic pattern. Whether it's an increase in the heart rate or a decrease in the heart rate, truly does depend upon how much of potassium imbalance you have and how long you've had it for. So it gets to be a big pain in the butt, what I'm trying to say. Put that in the back of your mind. At least realize that ions in improper amounts do have an effect on cardiac function. And the most common one is potassium, because it's very much dietary or health related. And it's also easy to monitor in that sense. Um, so what would the hypercalcemia cause? I mean, other than the spike and the depolarization, but what would it look like as far as would you turn your tachycardia? What would it do? Um, well, in a sense, it would lead to a, a, a tachycardia event, but it will also lead to a faster and more forceful contraction. So the idea of your stroke volume, would uh -huh. go up quite a bit. Okay. And so you would be looking at also probably, we'll kind of touch upon this about tonight, you know what an EKG is? Mm -hmm. And the QRS portion, mm -hmm. it'll be shorter. Okay. And you'll see that, on, and that's why you had those printouts to begin with, to look okay. for irregularities and patterns of time. So it may not be so much a, you know, fast or slow heart rate, but just the, the volume, I guess, or the... Well, if you have a, if you have a yeah, faster heart rate, per, so now you're getting into the, the, all the different cardiac things. So when we talk about cardiac physiology tonight and Wednesday, 
We're going to first go through the basics. Then on Wednesday's lecture, it is what determines cardiac output, which is the amount of blood per minute of time. There's two things to think about with that. First of all, how much blood is being contracted per contra or pumped up per contraction? And then how many contractions do I have per unit of time? So it's heart rate and stroke volume. But then there's gonna be some variable that determines stroke volume. So it gets a little bit of a, of a branching pattern. So we're gonna to try and keep this just a little more straightforward and just easy to do. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so if you have a person's heart who's like has a weaker um, contraction, such mm -hmm. as someone who has like CHF, okay. um, could the medication that is given to that be have calcium in them? Not in them, but it could affect calcium value. So on Wednesday, we're going to do a, a whiteboard lecture before lab. We're going to look at digitalis and see how digitalis actually leads to a drop in heart rate, but also an increase in the force of a ventricular contraction by messing up with the ability of these ions to be transported across the membrane of our nodal and our contractile cells. So usually you're looking at how the ions are being transported across the membrane. So, ask your question again, make sure that I'm thinking about it the right way. Oh, it was just pretty much just calcium in the medication that you can Right, use. so the, the, it's usually not the calcium in the medication, but the medication will affect calcium transport across the cell. Mm -hmm. And if you affect calcium transport across the cell, then you affect polarity or you affect the amount of calcium to land on troponin and to cause for a contraction. So that's how they mess around with calcium values. Okay. So the things that transport are so much of calcium in the medicine. But do keep that in mind because we're gonna talk about taking digitalis and what if you are suffering from hyperkalemia and you're taking digitalis? There's a problem with that, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. Okay, any questions on this? Yeah. Okay. So here's your thing. You may not even know what the heck this is for the moment, right? We're going to teach you this to you in the lecture tonight. So in a sense, you just sort of photograph this, look at it, go through lecture tonight, understand that this is a normal SA node action potential profile, and all we're talking about is how the calcium ions, too much of them or too little of them, can affect the actual formation of the repolarization portion of our action potential. And that's it. I mean, it's not that complicated. Okay. All right. So you guys like a, got a 40 minute break. So you could begin looking at this part of the notes if you want, or just go chit chat and nibble and Twitter and Facebook and see you in Twitter and Facebook. <laughs>